once again. Welcome to the program Lessons from the Word. Yeah, Lessons from God's Holy Word. We continue to look at the continue to look at the book Bible Answers. And today we're looking at Christ's second coming. And joining me once again, we have Pastor Lyndon Williams. Welcome, sir. Thank to you. To the program. And let's look at how Christ is going to come the second time. Mm -hmm. Say a word of prayer before we begin. Help us through this lesson. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks today for your love and your care. We ask that as we open the sacred scriptures, your spirit will speak to our minds, that we may understand our hearts, that we may obey. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I, got, I get a devotional from a uh, young man. Yeah. Uh, it's relatively young. Elder Joshua Smith. Every uh -huh. morning I get a devotional from him. Okay. And this morning, Pastor, his devotion was on Christ's second coming. And how he put it, I couldn't help but say, so true, we are all awaiting his second return. Now, now, I said that because, especially in this kind of a time that we're living in, we're awaiting Christ's return. Mm -hmm. But a songwriter has penned a very popular song. I pray we'll all be ready. And in there, it is said that two people could be someplace and one disappears. Mm -hmm. What say you? The song, I've heard it, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about the second coming and the state of readiness which um, individuals are in. Many use it to support the belief that the coming of Christ will be secret. So we hear about a secret rapture. Right. But what it's really talking about, and it's taking from a uh, story in the Bible, is one, two individuals will be working side by side. One will be ready, the other one is not. Right. And the one who is ready is the one who is caught up. But I do not believe that the scripture teaches a secret rapture Amen. where the righteous suddenly just vanish, you know, the pilot vanishes out of the plane. If the co-pilot is also saved, then you better pray you can land on autopilot, otherwise it's going down. All right. No, I don't think the scripture teaches that. But the song is implying that yes. there's a secret rapture. Uh -huh. Okay, so you're telling us that we may have taken the song, the, the, the parable out of context. Context, okay, yeah. Okay, good. So when Jesus was here on this earth, before he left, mm -hmm. in John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, he gave one of the promises that I like the last part where he says, where I am, they shall be also. Tell us about this promise that Jesus made. And then we move on to the promise that the uh, angel or someone said at his ascension that this same Jesus in John chapter, or in Acts chapter 1 verse 11, yeah. not John, Acts chapter 1 verse 11, this, he said, this same Jesus. So tell us about his promise, and then we can move to Acts chapter 1, verse 11. John 14, 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So the promise was given to the disciples initially, but to believers of all ages, that our Savior is going to prepare a place, which would be the New Jerusalem, and he's coming back to receive us unto himself. And Revelation talks about him coming with myriads of angels, or thousands of angels. He's not sending an ambassador, he's coming himself to take his faithful people to be with him forever. And when we move into Acts chapter 1, at his ascension, verse 9 says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, 
why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So the question is, if he comes in like manner as they had, as they had seen him go into heaven, in what manner did he go into heaven? It was a physical body, someone they could see, okay. a literal mm -hmm. body, okay? They could handle, they could touch, they could feel, they can see. So the senses were being exercised there. It was not something where he mysteriously, as a matter of fact, he told Thomas says, take your finger right. and put it into my side. Right. He see the nail prints, say, Feel it. a spirit that does not have flesh and bone. Amen. So he was a real physical, literal person Amen. with supernatural abilities who could actually walk through a wall. Okay. And that's the same person, that real physical, literal person that I'm looking forward to coming back to this earth. Amen. In, in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, mm -hmm. Paul refers to Christ as the blessed hope. Yeah. However, the question is asked, will all, will the inhabitants of the earth as a whole be prepared to meet him when he comes? No. Why? Just the, um, the song you were quoting, I'm trying to remember where the passage is, where it says two shall be in the field, one taken, the other left. He's basically saying, hey, some will not be ready. And he says, when he comes, he will separate his sheep from, from his goats. goats. Okay. And so if there's a separation, it means that the sheep will be saved, the goats will not be, which indicates not everyone will be saved, even though some what, funeral directors would like you to believe so. We better put a disclaimer on that. <laughs> uh, I didn't call anybody's name. Okay, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't. <laughs> I've heard okay. too many so put, put what will, persons in heaven. What will... What will the world be doing when Christ comes? Will it be business as usual? Yes. Why? Because we don't know? It's just the Lord tells us he must occupy until he comes, one. Um, and he says that in Revelation, John in Revelation saw what would happen. And he makes mention in chapter 6. I'm picking up at verse 13, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a tree cast it her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So notice what's happening in the natural world. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every born man, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountain. So that says that there's a section of humanity who will not be ready. And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? So everyone will not be ready. Everyone will not be greeting him. Some will be running from him as a matter of fact. Okay. Some will be running. Yes. Uh, that's where they get that we talk about. So we'll run to the hills and the rocks and all that stuff. I'll try to get them to hide us. But mm -hmm. Christ sees everything. So it says that we'll be, a time we'll be like him. When is that time? When we arise, I think of a passage in Thessalonians. Let's see. Thessalonians? No. I think I'm thinking of Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay, all right. And then I'd like to share a passage sure. too. Sure. says, in a moment, verse 52, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. That's one. Verse 53 says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Corruptible is something that decays, that changes. But when you put on incorruption, means you're no longer subject to decay. It talks about mortal, which means subject to death. But then if you put on immortality, or you receive immortality, you're no longer subject to death. I mean, yes, God can still and your yes, life forces. Yes. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about the things that will 
cause us to die here on this earth unless the Lord comes first. Okay. And so that's the process of change that will take place at the second coming of Christ, at the resurrection. Okay. And 1 John 1, 3 and 2 says, 1, chapter 3, chapter 3, and verse 2 says, Beloved, now we, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a really a, a, a good thing or that gives us extra hope that we won't, we don't have to be like we are all the time, like we are presently all through to the end, to the end, to the end. Yes, it's talking about change. And that is what's so important. At the beginning of this year, or was it last year? The lockdown and the, I've, I've my years off now, but. It's this year. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we did an initiative called Lord Transform Me. Yes. And that's what it's saying, that that change that God wants to see inside of us, that change will meet its ultimate fulfillment at the second coming of Christ and the ceaseless ages of eternity. Mm -hmm. And that's why our church said, Lord, transform me. Because we know he has the power, he has the desire to actually bring it about. Amen. Will Christ come and be the time of reward? Oh, yes. What kind of reward will that be? It depends on you. Oh, mm -hmm. it depends on me. Yes. So, I've been claiming Christianity for a long time. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing to show for my Christianity. But I'm doing the best that I can. Mm-hmm. What kind of reward is that? Ultimately, God decides a reward that we receive, but there are two basic rewards. Revelation also talks about the resurrection of life, uh -huh. and then it talks about the second death. The reward one receives is based on one's relation, relationship rather, to the Savior. And so for some, they will receive everlasting life. Others will receive everlasting shame and contempt. And everlasting is not to be confused with eternity. Okay. Jonah says he was in the belly of the whale forever. He was there, according to Jesus, about three, three days. days. So everlasting talks about, has places a greater emphasis on the state, the final state of the individual. So those who are lost, they are lost forever. That is it. There's no second chance. Those who are saved are saved. That's it. They're not going to, Lord is not going to change his mind or something. So it's de really dealing with the final state of the individual at that point. And Christ will determine who was faking from who was real. Isaiah talks about the waiting ones and what they'll say when Jesus comes. Tell us about that and why is it so important? It seems as if they feel stress-free now that he's come. Isaiah 25 and verse 9 tells us this great thing that persons waiting on Jesus to come will say. Okay. It reads, and it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. These people are saying, hey, we've waited. Can you imagine? Either, I'll give you a little context. The other day I had to do a funeral, and as I normally do while waiting for the funeral service to start at the graveside, I walk around, I look at the tombstones. I saw one there from 1847. Young lady at the age of 14 who had died. And she cannot see, think, feel anything. But can you imagine at that age, there's an indication that she was had some sort of sickness or something. We don't know. But can you imagine her waking up on the resurrection morning, and let's say for argument's sake, or for the sake of discussion, that she died from some sickness, 
maybe a contagious disease, you know, a number of things. When the last thing she might have felt was the pain of death as yes. they say she was slipping. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly she wakes and she realizes her body is no longer afflicted it's with whatever caused her to die. Mm -hmm. And she looks up and she sees the Savior coming in the clouds of heaven. Her heart would be filled with joy, just like all of the others who will be there to witness and rejoice, not just be there to witness, because Revelation indicates, chapter 6, that some will be running to the rocks and the mountains, crying out, fall on us. But others will be like, this is it, it's over. And that's going to be a glorious day when you realize that, hey, I have no more problems, no more stress, no sinus, no blood pressure, no COVID. None of all of mm. these things are in the past. Your body is healthy. You could feel a difference in your body from the time when either you died or the moments before it was changed. You could just feel the change, the energy surging through your body. And you know, hey, it's over. We're going to get our reward. We're going to be with the Savior. That's going to be something to shout about. That's Amen. something I look, I look forward to. But all of that said is good. Mm -hmm. So why, hasn't, why haven't we been informed of the time when Christ would come? For the simple reason, many people are procrastinators. If they knew, for example, that Jesus would come in 2030, they would do and they would have fun and they would ignore him and just live any life that they please until the last maybe week or so. And then all of a sudden everyone gets right. So he wants us to develop character. Therefore, he kept the day and time from us so that we will always be in a state of readiness because the state of readiness is a strong witness to others that you belong to God and God lives inside of you. He gives us, he gives us a, a warning that it won't be a great surprise. Mm -hmm. um, Luke chapter 21 verse 34 through 36. There is a warning that we won't really be surprised. So help us okay. understand what is being said there in that particular chapter, verse, those verses. Oh, it said Luke chapter 21, looking at 22. Um, the signs he gave us, I'm picking up I'm going to have to pick through verse 8. It says, Take heed that you do not be, that you be, that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near, go ye not therefore after them. So the first one here is false Christ. The second one, verse 9, you will hear of wars and commotions, but be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. So when we hear of wars, I think of the war that destroyed Jerusalem, the um, city of Jerusalem. But then there are other wars, and there are so many other things going on. Right now, our friends at the north are wondering what's going to happen, whether this will be the first time during the election they have civil unrest. And you have almost every country in the world, someone has said, having, um, having some major dispute with another country. So all of these things, pestilences, um, all of these signs tell us that Jesus is coming. Therefore, we don't have to be taken off hand. We can be ready. You say that with such assurance. How? Yes. Why? How we can be ready? Yes. By giving our lives solely, unreservedly, but to we Jesus always Christ. say that though, Pastor. Yes, and we need to start doing it. Is, 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 is it that easy? It may, may not be that a, easy per se. You may have had a privileged life mm -hmm. um, in terms of not being involved with gangs. And I don't know, I'm just saying, mm -hmm. because I got to know you, you were about 16, 17, I think, or right. 18, when you came to Grandstown. So before that, 
you may have had all this time you may have had the privileged life where you didn't live in the ghetto like I did or you didn't have or you had the parents there who were very protective and didn't allow you to get in to any trouble so you're saying that you're sitting there you're so calm and comfortable and you're saying these things that it's easy but to uh, someone looking on listening it may not be so easy so help us to understand how we can get to that place where we can say that we should be ready you get to that place by spending time with God how studying his word reading talking to him in prayer listening to his voice sometimes one writer says the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God and so before we started we were talking about Christmas and spending time telling you how I wouldn't let mind a cruise or get away to an basically an island which I'd have to myself we'll spend time with God and learn to listen to his voice look at nature and ask him for guidance to help you understand nature's laws etc and as you do this and you ask the Lord to change you you will begin to see change taking place in your life eventually so you have to ask God to change you he doesn't just change you I believe at times he does without you even asking him mm -hmm. because the spirit is always working in my case I, um, it was the Spirit drawing me through a series of Bible lessons, okay. topical lessons. Because when I was asked, I tell people I said yes to be polite. I figured would not, it would be impolite to tell the, um, the teacher no. And he was in our home, so I just said, said, Linda, would you like to join us for Bible study? I said yes. Had no interest. But not interested went. in Bible study. But you went. Yes. And once I went, it was like I was hooked because I like how he took scripture. On reading from scripture. the Bible? Well, yes, studying the Bible. It appealed to me, to my logical, analytical mind, how you could study a topic. And he was pulling from all these different books of the Bible. I just kept on going after that. And that so must have been a been very speaking. interesting Bible worker or, yes. or leader because to get a, a young teacher. person like yourself, at age 16, 15, 16, 16 yes. yeah. Interested in reading the Bible with, I guess, not much experience. Uh, tell us about that <laughs> as we end this program. For me, it was making the Bible come alive. A few times I tried to read the Bible on my own. and Prior to that? Yes. Okay. And I picked up the book of Revelation. After I got so far, I put it down. I was yeah. just frightened off with Rough it. Rough book, yeah. Yeah. But like I said, after studying your different topics and looking at scripture upon scripture and you writing it down after a while, things began, the light started turning on in my head. The Lord was drawing me and I didn't even know it. He was wooing me. He was calling me. And eventually, I tell people one night while running an errand for my mother, I was in no evangelistic meeting, no nothing. The Spirit of the Lord just says, why don't you give your life to Jesus tonight? While I was walking, nothing particular. So it didn't happen in the Bible study? No. He always asks, have you given your life to Jesus? My sister said yes, I said no. But the Lord was calling, he was drawing, he was wooing. Mm -hmm. And it happened that night while making that, um, running that errand. And when it occurred to me, I got excited. I remember that. It was a Wednesday night in the month of February, 1984. And I dropped my errand and I ran back home and knelt down by, by the sofa where I was sleeping at that point. And I gave my life to Jesus. No appeal, no nothing. But the studies of the scriptures had been working so their way. So how did you get to this church? The same gentleman called me, I mean, started inviting me after I learned about the Sabbath and certain other topics, to attend church, and I went. And I learned even more with what we call the Sabbath school with the lesson study. Okay. And that also gripped my attention, and I started reading and studying 
you know, more through, through that. And I was excited to learn that you know, all these things was in the Bible. I didn't know I was learning something. And eventually, I was baptized in like April of that same year, 1984, right on Nassau Street where Commonwealth Bank is. They had a big tent pitch there. The building was on the side of it, I think, still. Pastor I, Browning. That was Pastor Macmillan, Macmillan. at that time, okay. L.V. Macmillan. And that was it. The interesting thing is my spiritual father, I call him, Vernal Butler, late Vernal Butler, he had me as his assistant in the crusade. I was baptized as assistant Bible worker. So my job was supposed to go visit hold people on, and study with them. Hold on, hold on. You were not baptized yet? No. And you worked going to people yeah, we did to a few help visits. to bring them out uh -huh. to church for mm -hmm. baptism? I also was involved in the planning of that evangelistic effort. Brother Bernard was crazy. No, when they met inside Grand Sand Church, I planned the effort. I was there for every meeting. And I was not even baptized? a member of the church. No. That's, some, that's because of what he saw inside of me. Okay. He had that level of confidence that he made me his assistant Bible worker. Okay. Wow, kudos to <laughs> Elder Vernal Butler, a very good family <laughs> friend. Uh, that was, that's different. That's different. And so uh, you're here. Mm -hmm. We're closing. Time is gone. Yeah. But you became a pastor. Yeah. Uh, help us understand. We're talking about the second coming. Keep yeah. in mind. You became a pastor. How did that happen? And was it a good decision that you can look back on and say, I have no regrets? <laughs> one, one Sabbath afternoon, outside Grand Sand Church in front of the annex, mm -hmm. I received a call, and it came to another individual, Pastor Ken Price. Said, okay. we were just talking with you guys here, me, Pastor Andrew Burroughs, Ralph, I forgot Ralph's surname. Think you should go in the ministry. He said, we laughed. He said, no, boy. You know, Andrew is an auto mechanic. I mean, I'm an aircraft mechanic. I was doing electrical insulation. I don't remember what Ralph was doing at the time. What's Ralph? I don't remember his surname. Church. Doesn't attend church. He was at Grandson at the time. Oh, okay. And I went home that night, forgotten about the conversation while watching a movie. The thought just started coming back to me slowly, 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 and I brushed it aside. But the persistence just come, they should go study for ministry. And finally, I couldn't watch a movie anymore. I went in my bedroom, knelt down, and started praying because I knew what was happening. The Lord was calling me. I didn't want no part of that. Pastor ministry, not my thing. And I remember wrestling like Jacob with God. Amen. I don't know how long it was, 30 uh -huh. minutes or an hour, I don't know. But eventually, I saw I wasn't winning. So I threw in the towel. I said, okay, if this is what you want me to do, you have to give me the strength. Because by then, tears were flowing down my face. You want me to do what? I don't want to do it. No. And the next morning, my brother said to me, have you ever thought about going to West Indies College to study for pastoral ministry? I had not spoken to anybody at that point. He didn't know. Medicine. No. I hadn't spoken to mommy. Nobody. And he was not yet a Christian. No, he was not. But he was encouraging you. Yes. Wow. And so that confirmed for me that this is what God wanted me to do. Sometimes, yes, I was like, Lord, is you sure this is what you want me to do? Because sometimes I feel inadequate. Mm -hmm. And he has this unique way of speaking to me that, okay. hey, stay the course. I have something special for you to do. And I'm going to lead you. And Psalm 32 and verse 8 is one of the passages that I love that came to me while reading another book. The impending conflict. I was reading it and I was reading the Bible that night. When I reached verse 8, I didn't hear anything audibly. I know that. Mm -hmm. But the passage spoke so strong, like it jumped off the page. I will instruct you. Mm -hmm. I will teach you mm -hmm. in the way you should go. Amen. I will guide you with mine eye. And the rest Amen. of the verses just went. And I read it again, but I didn't get the same experience. Wow. That's a story, Pastor. So that Williams. helps me to stay the course when I'm discouraged. Amen. Until Christ comes again. Amen. One of these days, we're going to uh, do a series on how persons receive the Lord mm -hmm. and how they uh, came to be pastors, elders, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear that story, and I'm certain that it would be something that would encourage others. Mm -hmm. Continue to uh, do the work of the Lord. 
uh, help to save others to come to know him to be ready for his second coming. Okay. Thank you very much, Pastor. And thank you for continuing to join us on this program. We pray, we earnestly pray that you be ready when Christ comes.